and welcome to another installment of the Words Ireland lecture series, delivered by writers, for writers, on writing. There are six lectures in the series with a new one made available each week between the 27th of October and the 1st of December 2020. You can view each lecture at wordsireland.ie or on Words Ireland's YouTube channel. This particular lecture is delivered in partnership with the Museum of Literature Ireland. And today... We're going to talk a little bit about poetry and innovation in contemporary Anglophone poetry. For the past 10 years, I've been reviewing poetry for a number of different outlets. For Poetry Ireland Review, I generally look at Irish debuts. For Sabotage Reviews, a UK-based website, I look at pamphlets from emerging UK voices. And for RTE's Arena, I look at new work from the UK and the USA. From this pattern of reviewing, certain questions have emerged around poetry, innovation, tradition, and it's these questions I'd like to pursue a little today. What interests me in particular is the idea of innovation in poetry. Who is innovating in English language poetry? What form does this innovation take? Are there countries or poetic groupings who are forging ahead and others who are cleaving to to tradition and why? I'd like to define innovation today as separate from the avant-garde, as I feel that this is a discrete area in English language poetry, which requires its own lecture and on which others are much better placed to comment. But I will be mentioning a few avant-garde voices throughout, as I'm aware that the definitions in this area are quite porous. To start the lecture in a very cliched manner, The OED defines innovation as the action of making changes in something established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. Since I don't think we can really divorce poetry publishing and sales from our current all-encompassing late-stage capitalist milieu, I next turn to a website called Idea to Value for further illumination. This is a tech startup website, and it has an interesting Q&A with 15 well-known startup leaders, which asks each of them what innovation means to them. The general consensus is that creativity is the task of dreaming up a new idea, but innovation means implementing the idea to add value to the product, Bunny Ears authors own. I think most poets would balk at the idea of their work being assigned its value by neoliberal capitalist systems. And yet there's something of interest in the business speak here that I think we can return to later. Soon, I'd like to move on to some poets who I've read or have been recommended to me as innovators in English language poetry. But first, I'd like to reinforce the idea that today's lecture is intended as a conversation opener and not a definitive statement. When I was first approached by Words Ireland with a question on what kind of professional development ideas I might value as a poet, I had said that I would love to see a conversation on innovation between different poetic traditions, between some high profile US, UK and Irish poets, exploring their own traditions and how they disrupt or continue those traditions. I hope this live event may come to pass someday, but in the meantime, perhaps we can start some discussion here. I'm proposing to look at the work of 10 poets. From a Twitter survey where I asked poets and poetry readers to recommend their favourite innovators, someone who, in my words, refreshes the poetry reading experience for them, a number of names came up again and again. From the US, there was Anne Carson, Maggie Nelson, Ilya Kaminsky, Ocean Wong, Dana Smith. From the UK, Manny Capaldeo, Banu Kapil and Denise Riley. From Ireland, Stephen Sexton, Maeve McGuckian, Susanna Dickey, Kimberly Campanello, Alva Darcy, Tara Bergen and uh, Elaine Feeney were mentioned several times. There are obviously a lot of notable omissions from these lists um, and there's obviously a much longer conversation to be had another day about the poetic forebears of this particular generation that we're going to be discussing. So let's take a a look at the work of some of these poets, um, firstly for the pure enjoyment of doing so, but also to try and identify what it is exactly that might group them together as innovators. I'm hoping the process will allow us to draw some conclusions about contemporary poetic fashions and trends and how poets respond to their own environments. Let's start with the USA and Ocean Vuong. 
I reviewed his Night Sky with Exit Wounds for Arena back in 2018, and I fell in love with his deeply embodied, hyper-aware poetry, which explores his origins and identity with empathy and lyricism. I think Vuong is an interesting example of American poetry in the current moment, a poetics which attempts to explore the true legacy of the melting pot and a country that's been at war for around 222 of its 244 years. Of course, there are some who are a bit hostile to this kind of poetry with its deep vein of individualism, but some of the criticism levelled focuses uncomfortably on racial origin, as if minority identity is some kind of meal ticket. And when Sarah Howe, an English poet with Chinese heritage, won the T.S. Eliot Prize, one commentator asked, was it perhaps, as some suggested, for extra poetic reasons? As a successful and very presentable young woman with dual Anglo-Chinese heritage. So I think the question we need to ask in response to this kind of statement is, why do any of us write poetry if not to synthesize experiences which can be both joyful and troubling and examine our place in the world? If we find ourselves part of a minority in a country which has historically been run by a white patriarchy, how do we write honestly without reflecting this experience? And Vuong's experience is singular, but only in that we, the middle class poetry reading audience, have perhaps not yet heard its stories told by the large minority whose experience has been similar. Where Vuong comes to the fore as an innovator is not only in the gripping nature of his subject matter, but in his mode of expression. Alongside the uniqueness of Vuong's experience, we find a voice full of energies and tensions, a voice fit to tell the story of his origins with delicacy, earthiness and sensuality. He's interested in the compromised nature of his origins as the descendant of a Vietnamese woman and an American soldier, and physical intimacy in the book often becomes the site of exploitation, even violence. Obad with Burning City shows us a soldier and his mistress in a hotel room as Saigon burns around them. Lines from Irving Berlin's White Christmas, used by the army as a code to attack, are interspersed throughout the poem. The lines extracted here are working on so many levels to communicate discomfort, dislocation, abuse of power. From the use of the word Obad in the poem's title, we are placed within a long romantic tradition of Anglophone poetry, which is immediately disrupted. The decadence of the champagne, the commands of the soldier, the schmaltz of white Christmas, which impinges dirge-like on the poem's apocalyptic imagery again and again, creates a subversive hybridity. These are the gifts of culture, Vuong tells us. The ability to use a familiar frame to mount a horror show. The jagged enjambement throughout spikes our adrenaline, leaving us in suspense as we round each of the poem's corners. Vuong's power as an innovator lies in his ability to both cleave to and cleave the Anglophone lyrical tradition, laying the foundations for a world we recognise only to disrupt it through his provocative use of form. What we are left with is a stark look into a world we may, up until now, have had the privilege to ignore. But we are also invited, over the course of the book, into a warm, humane and ultimately lyrical exploration of the complexities of human empathy and relations. I'd like to turn next to Ilya Kaminsky, whose collection Deaf Republic has made a huge impact on the poetry reading public in the past year. At a recent workshop I attended, Kaminsky spoke compellingly about how poets refresh the language, whether it's their mother tongue, an adopted language, or a unique regional dialect. He spoke about how Emily Dickinson, a native English speaker, had never written a proper English sentence in her life, and how poetry always goes for non-normative speech. The idea of a disruption of language is explored to great reward in Deaf Republic. How to describe this book? It's a book haunted by the great wars of Europe and America and which engages the frameworks of many literary traditions as a proscenium arch through which to gaze at the action which unfolds. This magic realist theatrical microcosm allows us to explore contemporary culture, warfare, deaf culture, cultural erasure through a formal structure which suggests that the events depicted could be happening, are happening everywhere. Much like Dickinson, the language here is both bare-boned and carefully chosen. There is a cleanness to the work, a confidence in the universality of what's expressed that releases the poems into realms where a single, precisely chosen word can resonate, such as the word quiet in this two-line poem that you can see on the screen now. 
Similarly, the elements of sign language used throughout the book are in themselves small, concrete poems, allowing the reader a glimpse of the richness of deaf culture. Here, as with Vuong's work, identity and the calamity of war are foregrounded at the heart of a society which is being forced to question long-held ideas of nationhood. There are so many poems to choose from in this book which demonstrate Kaminsky's great artistry and vision, but I'd like us to take a quick look at We Lived Happily During the War, a great state of any nation poem which confronts the reader with some very uncomfortable truths about the way that we live comfortably in opposition. There's something prophetic in the tone of this poem, especially when we come to the annal-like time stamp of the poem's latter half. Here, the work feels almost prescient of the US coronavirus response. But what interests me about this poem and about Kaminsky's project as a whole is how he has intelligently inhabited the magic realist tradition of Garcia Marquez, Borges, and Russian literature as far back as Gogol to tell us something fresh about our contemporary world. The language here is utterly dedicated to the primacy of image and idea. The cleanness of modernism meets the lush fable of magic realism. If innovation is a successful delivery of new ideas within old frameworks, I think Kaminsky has succeeded. And now to a very different kind of innovation. I'd love to take us on a deep dive into the work of Anne Carson, but we only have time for a paddle. I unfolded my copy of Knox the other day, a work I gingerly and probably a little reverently thumbed through when I first purchased it in awe of its existence as objet d'art, as well as a book of poetry. Carson's approach is very different to the other two poets we've discussed. Her innovation comes less in the form of introducing new cultural hybridity into a living tradition and more in terms of bending form to her will. She is one of those once-in-a-generation writers who transcends the rules, and her contribution to the often contested form of the prose poem can't be understated. Uh, for more on this, see some of the online responses to Jeremy Noel Todd's indispensable Penguin Book of the Prose Poem. Knox, as a piece of work, is tremendously difficult to extract from. It's a box containing a concertina reproduction of a notebook, cataloguing in parallel the translation of Catullus Poem 101 and the death of the poet's estranged brother. It's a poetry object, a perfect marriage of form and content, and I'm never sure if I want to read it or just take it out of the book and wrap it around myself. Rather than commenting on the individual pieces, I'd like to share some of the images with you. Uh, One of them is Carson's translation of Catullus 101, and another is a notebook extract. What we see here is a project, an idea that's been keenly felt and approached through different intellectual interrogation tactics. Notebook, doodling, journaling, translation, definition as poetry, memoir. While as an object it's unwieldy and fragmented, it's a hugely influential piece and we'll see how it's come to bear on the work of some other poets a little later. So what does this brief survey of three contemporary American poets teach us about innovation? Firstly, I think it's that overdue explorations of identity through a bifurcation or adaptation of tradition is at the heart of much successful contemporary innovation. The second is that play with form, often seen as the preserve of the avant-garde, can work in a subtle way to deliver the subject matter in a way that is compelling, for example, in Kaminsky's adaptation of magic realist frameworks and in Carson's intriguing rethinking of the poem as object. Do we find a difference of approach in contemporary UK poetry? Let's take a quick look at some work by Vanu Capildeo, Denise Riley and Vanu Kapil. I'll begin with Vanu Kapil, whose recent How to Wash a Heart is an intriguing, precise collection, telling the story of the subtle but meaningful culture clashes which emerge between guest and host, whether in the microcosm of one household or the macrocosm of the state. Like Claudia Rankin, Kapil is a master observer of the discord that lurks behind niceties and the systemic racism that fuels this discord. This is a wryly funny book at the same time, full of humanity and even humour in the face of the absurd cognitive dissonance of racism. The poems in this sequence are untitled, tightly honed, delicate, but always full of impact. As a person who has edited an anthology of work by writers and artists in Ireland's direct provision system, I've become really aware of the cost to a person of being asked to tell a traumatic story again and again, and also of the often misguided aim in asking a person to do so. 
Kapil captures his experience with her usual blend of restraint and searing imagery in the piece you're seeing on the screen now. The poem shares so much about the immigrant experience, the way narrative is shaped, made palatable for others, repeated on demand, the way details of the former life are ignored or brushed aside, and the small cultural dissonances that make understanding so difficult. Kapil's innovation here, I think, comes from her ability to capture these dissonances with such insight. Like Vuong, her line breaks are propulsive and disorientating, much like the speaker's experience, asked to parse themselves into a single narrative. How can we achieve this without fracture of the self? Denise Riley's Say Something Back marked an important moment of recognition for a much-loved poet who'd been working in a very particular vein for a long time. In recent years, and following the tragic loss of a son, she's gifted us with work which pushes one of the great remaining Western taboos, the honest, unflinching and unsentimental exploration of death. The raw imperative of the collection's title, taken from a W.S. Graham poem, tells the reader that this is not a book of easy platitudes about a departed loved one. It's a shout into the void with no answer. And yet, as a book, it's full of life. Can we write about death without being morbid within the Western framework? Riley's innovation is to write about death in the spirit of philosophical or scientific inquiry while carrying the kernel of our own loss within each poem. Riley is certainly a poet working within established traditions. Her references are often to the classics. Even the red blue sea in this poem brings to mind Homer's wine dark sea. And the dead in these poems populate a familiar underworld flirting with Persephone. Her innovation is perhaps her honesty, the lack of ornamentation or romanticization of feelings of grief, her pushing of the boundaries of imagination. Vanni Capaldeo is another poet who is inimitable in terms of voice and expression. Capaldeo's work creates and populates new registers, opening doors into new worlds, exploring the experience of immigration through a rich, dense intertextual layer, almost creating a language in itself. As a lexicographer, Capaldeo has said of her work, language is my home, a potential site of wholeness in a world where inflexible ideas about identity can threaten to pull us asunder. Measures of Expatriation, her forward prize winning 2016 collection, is an expansive, absorbing collection in which connections are made and broken, and in which the full flexibility of language is demonstrated at every turn. Like Capil, Capaldeo explores national identity, patria, and the means by which the expatriation of the collection's title can occur. A dense and rewarding collection, it is perhaps as difficult to extract from as Carson's Knox. Fire and Darkness, and also No Join, Like, plays wonderful associative games with language, bringing us from the history of Guido Fox to the liberation of Kuwait, watched on TV in a Trinidadian sitting room. The switches between association and dissociation which occur in the poem, the association between shadowy figures and threats from history, and the dissociation felt when watching a liberation, which involves the bombing of brown-skinned people, brings home to the reader an entire structure of knowledge and knowing which excludes hybridised identities. Fanny Capaldeo is a poem who swims through language like a fish through water. Like Carson, she's a true experimenter, always at home in her chosen element, whether it be lyric or prose poem, shaping these forms to suit her. So to sum up our all too brief exploration of UK innovators, we see a number of the same tendencies as are explored in the USA. A preoccupation with the rightful foregrounding of the experiences of the contemporary UK and all of its diversity, paired with an attempt to remake and reshape old forms to accommodate the lived realities of contemporary poets and citizens. The difference here is perhaps an even more complicated inner migration through language, perhaps brought about by a vexed or complex relationship with what is still termed the Queen's English. And now finally, and with far too little time, to Ireland and Northern Ireland to try and tie some of the strands of this work together and see how innovation is imported or indeed exported from our small island. I'd like to talk about Tara Bergen, Kimberly Campanello, Stephen Sexton and Susanna Dickey. Tara Bergen is one of the most singular voices working in contemporary poetry today. 
In her most recent collection, The Tragic Death of Eleanor Marx, she explores the fate of the eponymous translator of Flaubert, Karl Marx's daughter, who reenacted Emma Bovary's suicide. The word playful is one that's taken on slightly negative connotations when applied to women's work, but there is so much play in a work here that could otherwise be quite academic. A cool, clear, understated voice weaving an atmosphere tinged by the uncanny, exploring dynamics that are anything but simple. To return to the notion of play, this word is important with regards to Bergen's work. One of the rich themes running throughout the book is of the potential of theatre in terms of structure and form to contain poetic tensions. The collection as a whole explores translation, subtext, transmogrification of the self within poems that act as brightly painted sets, each awaiting its virtuosic performance during which performers might wink at the audience or suffer Bichetti in despair at the blankness of the fourth wall. Bergen's innovation is formal and linguistic, her radical act reclaiming a forgotten voice. This is a major act of ventriloquism in which the reader happily loses all certainties. Moving to a very different voice, Kimberly Campanello, originally from the US and now based in Leeds, published her first two collections in Ireland and has returned to Ireland again in terms of subject matter with her Mother Baby Home, a 796 page collection of concrete and visual poetry dealing with the reports around the tomb, Mother and Baby Home, which have so shaken Irish society in recent times. You'll see some of the work on the screen now. Campanello is a driven and focused poet, and the pains of responding to such brutal subject matter are captured in the twisted and tortured words that collide on the pages of this devastating collection. Much like the previous collections we've encountered today, innovation here comes both in terms of subject and chosen form. Campanello acknowledges the tradition in which she's working, including Thomas Kinsella's 1972 collection, Butcher's Dozen, which responded to Bloody Sunday. Much as with Anne Carson's work, a single extract hardly does this work justice, but I think the following demonstrates Campanello's chilling deconstruction of the institutional language around these homes and how that language has been weaponized by successive generations to hide the crimes we, as a state, perpetrated on our own people, a coolly wrought but ultimately devastating marriage of form and content. Moving to Northern Ireland which continues to deserve its reputation as a stronghold of poetic success and innovation, I'd like to speak briefly about Stephen Sexton and Susanna Dickey, two graduates of the Seamus Heaney Centre. Stephen Sexton's collection, If All the World and Love Were Young, was one of the poetry sensations of the past few years. Its innovative collision of precise form, heartfelt elegy, subversive pastoral and video game culture, providing what we would probably call in music terms a surprise crossover hit. There's so much to say about this collection, but what sets it apart is its use of formal constraint, the convention of video game levels as a framework for a creative inner journey, which reveals richly metaphysical realms where video game, childhood memory and hospital vistas collide. As you can see on the screen, the 16-bit nature of Super Mario World even inflects the meter of the poem's individual lines, divided here into two eight-syllable columns, one repeating mantra-like, the image of charming domesticity, the other unravelling fitfully into a series of images suggesting chaos, breakdown, but eventual celebration. Sexton, like Carson and Campanello, is fully aware of the inspiration that formal constraint can unlock. Susanna Dickey, another graduate of the Seamus Heaney Centre, takes a similarly form-driven approach in her recent pamphlet, Bloodthirsty for Marriage, where she educates the reader on the connotations of the Hendeka syllable via a quote from Muriel's wedding. Like Sexton, she finds liberation in this approach and flight within form. The pamphlet abounds with surreal and striking imagery, classical reference and pop culture. So from this brief survey, we can see that Irish poetry, while as engaged in innovation as its US and UK counterparts, is taking a slightly difficult, different and more circuitous journey towards explorations of evolving Irish identities. Issues around the history of the Irish state and its failures are coming to the fore, and yet perhaps the concerns of new Irish communities or second generation communities will provide the poetic subject matter of the future. I want to state again at this point that innovation and quality are not synonymous, and this lecture is not meant to suggest that they are. There are plenty of poets doing fantastic work in Ireland today who might be praised for several 
virtues other than simply innovation. I'm also aware, as I said earlier, that I haven't had the time to look back in detail on the innovative forebears of the Irish poets we've explored here today. But I do think it's striking that each of the Irish poets discussed, all of whom were suggested by repeated reference on my online straw poll, have published the collections discussed outside of Ireland. I think the same can be said for a number of Irish writers currently writing on queer identities. Some of the poets above have, of course, also published other collections with Irish publishers. But I do wonder whether innovation is currently the highest priority of the Irish poetry scene. This isn't intended as a criticism, but rather a provocation to ask ourselves if some of our most promising younger poets are finding more kinship in the work produced overseas. The question of funding and the paucity thereof can't be ignored in this context. And here I think we must return to the demands of the neoliberal capitalist system, which designates innovation its supposed value. We all exist within this system and assigning blame to any one cog is not necessarily a useful exercise. This lecture is simply a conversation opener based around a survey conducted with very imperfect parameters. Other contemporary innovators mentioned included Natasha Cuddington, Elaine Feeney, Maeve McGuckian, Christodoulos Macris and Trevor Joyce, and many of these have published with Irish publishers whose faith in the work deserves recognition. I'm eager to hear, or perhaps even write myself, the next instalment that explores in more detail the work of these and other Irish innovators. So thank you for joining us today for this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>